Okay, welcome to our last uh, week in my section of the course. Uh, in this week, we're going to dive into chapter six in the Janeway textbook and talk a lot of more, a lot more about the process of antigen presentation um, and uh, talk especially a bit more about the genetics of MHC, which is actually a really interesting uh, piece of our of our immunology. And so, um, we're going to start in this first lecture by talking about the presentation of endogenous antigens. So, what do I mean by endogenous antigens? Well, different types of pathogens, of course, are found in different locations relative to the cell or relative to the tissue where they're in. So you can sort of see this here. We might have cytosolic pathogens, those pathogens that primarily live inside of intracellular vesicles, um, as well as, of course, extracellular pathogens and toxins and those sorts of things. And so uh, we'll start by talking about cytosolic pathogens because these are typically what we mean when we refer to endogenous pathogens, and therefore their antigens are endogenous antigens. So uh, pathogens that live inside the cell, these include all viruses and a number of small uh, uh, bacteria, um, and even a few parasites are, um, are obligate intracellular parasites. Um, and what this means is that because they sort of live inside the cytoplasm, they are susceptible to degradation inside the cytoplasm. And so we need to process the antigens that come from these, uh, these pathogens through cytosolic pathways, through endogenous pathways within the cell. And so typically um, what happens is these types of, of pathogens are degraded in the cytosol and they end up being presented on MHC class one for reasons that we'll get into in this lecture. Um, because they're uh, presented by MHC class one, they tend to then activate, of course, effector CD8 T cells, which leads to cell death of the infected cell um, because that is the effector function of CD8 T cells. This is in contrast to other types of pathogens like those that um, are found uh, within vesicles. So typically these are things that are being, um, you know, either phagocytosed or uh, they make a vesicular structure when they infect the cell, but they're not in the cytoplasm is the point. They're, they're separated from the cytoplasm of the cell um, by some kind of vesicular structure. And so they're going to be broken down within endocytic vesicles. So for when, we, when we're talking about endocytic vesicles throughout this unit, throughout this module, um, we basically mean, you know, the phagosome, the lysosome, the endosome, you know, all of those vesicular structures that can contain things and segregate them from the cytoplasm, basically. Um, uh, these sorts of intravesicular pathogens, um, they get broken down inside the vesicular system, and so um, they end up sort of being more often routed to MHC class 2, and because of that, they tend to cause the activation of effector CD4 T cells. And remember, CD4 T cells, they don't kill their targets, they secrete cytokines, which cause some change in the, in the target cell. So for a cell like a macrophage or a dendritic cell, which is eating pathogens, oftentimes the CD4 T cell, um, once it sees the antigen on that antigen presenting cell, it's gonna secrete cytokines like interferon gamma, which cause the macrophage or the dendritic cell to become activated. That, uh, that um, allows them to start making uh, their effector functions which degrade intracellular pathogens. So, uh, you know, those proteolytic enzymes that they release into the phagosome, those sorts of things that we covered a few units ago. Um, same thing with extracellular pathogens and toxins. Um, they also tend to be um, either endocytosed in the case of B cells or um, phagocytosed by uh, innate immune cells, but same sort of thing. They end up getting processed and presented on MHC class two, which leads to CD4 T cell activation. Now in the case of B cells, this stimulates them to secrete um, uh, antibodies, and so those antibodies can then bind to those extracellular pathogens and toxins and then target them for antibody effector functions in order to take care of them. So depending on where the pathogen is, is going to depend where um, where in the cell its antigen is, and so um, as we'll see, that's going to influence whether or not it's presented on MHC class 1 versus MHC class 2. Um, so what are some of the differences between MHC class 1 and 2 that we haven't yet discussed? Well, as you can see here, um, they, you know, they have a pretty similar molecular shape, um, but there are some differences. Um, recall that in MHC class one, the antigen is bound by the alpha one and the alpha two domain of the MHC class one molecule, and that forms the peptide binding groove. The peptide here is kind of in this orange color here in the middle. Um, uh, in contrast, in MHC class two, the peptide is bound by the alpha one domain on the alpha chain and the beta one domain on the beta chain. So remember, MHC class one only has an alpha chain uh, associated with a molecule called beta two microglobulin, whereas MHC class two is made up solely of an alpha chain and a distinct beta chain. 
Um, so uh, you can see that here, uh, these where, where the bind, peptide binding domains are on the MHC molecules. Some other differences are that um, it's it's hard to tell if you're not used to looking at these structural diagrams, but the the peptide binding domain of uh, of MHC class one is closed on both ends. And really, the only way that that the reason that that matters is that there's just a little bit less room for for uh, the peptide. And so for that reason, uh, in comparison to MHC class two, who whose gro groove is open at both ends, MHC class 1 tends to present slightly shorter peptides, so 8 to 10 amino acids long, so pretty short, right? Um, only 8 to 10 amino acids, whereas MHC class 2, um, it presents slightly longer peptides, so 13 to 18 amino acids. Now, you know, on the grand scale of things, that's still pretty small, um, but it ends up mattering a little bit in terms of which types of peptides and ultimately which types of antigens then are suited for MHC class 1 versus MHC class 2. Um, so there's some additional information here about the way that the peptide binds to the MHC molecules, which I won't, I won't read to you. Um, but overall, big idea here is that um, uh, you should know which domains of the MHC bind to the the, the antigen for both. Uh, cases, MHC class 1 and MHC class 2, um, and that MHC class 1 tends to bind smaller peptides as opposed to MHC class 2. Um, another difference um, in terms of which types of uh, antigens end up being presented on which type of MHC has to do, again, with where in the cell this process happens. And so, um, as we'll see throughout this module, uh, endogenous antigens tend to be uh, routed or presented on MHC class 1, uh, and exogenous antigens, those that come from outside the cell, tend to be presented on MHC class 2. And so in this lecture, we're going to focus on the endogenous pathway, which you can see here, but I want to introduce them both as we start the unit. Um, so when we have an endogenous antigen, something like a viral infection, and the viral infection is making its proteins, making the viral proteins, those uh, antigens are going to be degraded by a cytoplasmic proteasome. So a proteasome um, is just a, a catalytic uh, enzyme complex which is going to degrade proteins into smaller fragments. Those fragments end up being transported into the rough endoplasmic reticulum or RER um, and through a process that we'll get into in detail, um, those, uh, those uh, antigenic peptides then are going to be loaded onto MHC class 1 in the rough ER um, and uh, then uh, through processing uh, that that happens downstream, uh, vesicular structures are going to bud off of the rough ER, go through the Golgi complex, and ultimately to the surface of the cell where the antigen ends up being presented by MHC class 1. This is in contrast to the exogenous pathway where M MHC class 2 starts in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. It's a protein. It needs to be made, right? Uh, but it doesn't see its antigen there. So, the, so exogenous antigens are not processed in the ER. Instead, they come in from the outside through ways that we've seen, phagocytosis or endocytosis, and they get degraded inside those vesicular structures by endosomal proteases instead of the proteasome. Um, and they sort of meet up with MHC class 2 later as MHC class 2 is being targeted to the membrane. And so, uh, again, we'll get into all the molecular details of this later. Um, but basically, um, the process by which MHC class 2 binds to its antigen happens later in its life cycle, basically right before it reaches the cell surface. But ultimately then we see MHC class 1 and MHC class 2. They have their antigen, they're on the cell surface, and so then they're available to show that antigen to their respective T cell partners. So I said we were going to start with MHC class 1. So let's dig in a little bit deeper into some of the things that I introduced in the endogenous pathway. So um, the um, Proteins that are made up or that make up the antigens for our various intracellular infections, again, like viruses or intracellular bacteria, um, they're going to be making their proteins, or there might be other things, just like damaged proteins that the cell makes, or, or proteins associated with cancer, which we call neoantigens. Um, but in whatever case, uh, remember that proteins in cells are, are frequently turned over, and they're often targeted for degradation so that we can recycle the amino acids in them and use them for other things. And so um, you may have covered this in another class. We don't know, need to know extreme detail here, but um, hopefully recall that uh, proteins can be targeted for degradation by a system called uh, ubiquitin. So um, uh, proteins that have been targeted for degradation, are um, uh, they, are, they have these ubiquitin molecules added to them, and so there's a lot of them. So this process is called ubiquitination or ubiquitin conjugation. And these ubiquitin molecules target the protein to a enzymatic complex called the 20S proteasome. Um, the proteasome uh, takes these proteins and degrades them into smaller peptide fragments. And you can kind of see where this is going, hopefully. 
Um, but the proteasome itself, as it's introduced in your textbook, is made up of a 20S core and then these two 19S regulatory caps. And so you need uh, both of these components in order to form a functional proteasome. Um, but as you can see here, the ubiquitinated polyproteins, um, uh, or polyubiquitinated proteins, sorry, um, get targeted to the proteasome and, you know, through mechanisms, which uh, you can learn about in a cell biology class, they get degraded into much smaller fragments, which can actually serve as the antigenic peptides that we can load onto MHC class 1. So uh, zooming out a little bit, we see the same thing that we just saw here. Proteins get degraded by the immunoproteasome into uh, these smaller peptides and often these peptides just get degraded further into amino acids and again we recycle them like I said before. However, an enzyme called TAP uh, is uh, important for taking some of these peptides and shuttling them out of the cytosol into the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Um, and inside the rough endoplasmic reticulum, uh, they are then available to be bound to these MHC class 1 molecules that are being made also in the ER. So TAP is kind of like a transporter and you can see this is an active process. It requires uh, ATP in order to happen, so we spend a lot of energy on this. Um, but TAP is found within the, the, the membrane of the rough endoplasmic reticulum, um, and it shuttles peptides out of the cytoplasm and into the lumen of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Um, so you can see the structure of this, again, from your textbook, um, which shows the sort of same thing. Uh, the TAP molecule has a hydrophobic transmembrane domain, uh, which allows it to span the membrane. Uh, in this case, the ER is up here and the cytosol is down here. Um, but uh, there's also an ATP binding can set. So we need ATP. We need an active energetic process in order to actively transport peptides um, across the, the membrane of the ER. So what happens once we move these peptide fragments into the ER? Well, uh, MHC class 1 needs a lot of help in order to actually bind to those peptides. Uh, one reason for this is that MHC molecules are inherently unstable, um, and they stay unfolded for a lot of their life cycle. And, and really, the MHC molecule is not stable, and it's, it can't sort of uh, stay put together until it has its antigen bound. And so for that reason, um, we need a lot of help from chaperone proteins in the ER to keep the MHC, one, uh, MHC class 1 molecule together um, until it binds to its antigen. So so um, the proteins that help facilitate this collectively uh, we refer to as the peptide loading complex or PLC. So I've listed some of the major members of the PLC here. Um, the first is a molecule called calnexin. So this is a chaperone which initially stabilizes the MHC class 1 alpha chain. So again, remember that MHC class 1 has an alpha chain with three subunits, and then we add beta 2 microglobulin to that to make the final MHC class 1 molecule. Well, when MHC class 1 alpha chain is made, it's, it's very unstable, and so calnexin binds to it at first and prevents its dissociation. So calnexin is a chaperone molecule which holds the MHC class 1 alpha chain together until it binds to beta 2 micro tubulin, which you can see here. Um, um, at this point, though, uh, of course, we need to add uh, the antigen to the alpha chain beta 2 micro microtube or microglobulin, sorry, I might have been saying microtubulin, uh, beta 2 microglobulin uh, molecule. So we have our intact MHC class 1 here. But as you can see, there are a bunch of other uh, uh, chaperone proteins now which we add to the mix. So a few of those I've listed here. So um, there's calreticulin, which is also kind of just a general chaperone molecule that just holds everything together. Um, but sort of more importantly, there are um, a couple of others which sort of form the link to the, to the antigen, which is where we want to go. So ERP57 is also a chaperone molecule, but it facilitates MHC class 1's association with a molecule called tapasin. So you can see this here. Um, ERP57 is um, sort of holding the MHC class 1 molecule next to this molecule called tapasin. And tapasin forms a bridge between MHC class 1 and TAP. So recall from the last slide that TAP is actually the molecule that's going to transport the antigen out of the cytosol and into the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So tapasin is the bridge that sort of holds MHC class 1 close to the TAP molecule so that the antigen can actually get onto it. So collectively, these molecules are referred to as the peptide loading complex because we need them all in a complex in order to hold the MHD class 1 molecule together, prevent it from breaking apart, and actually bring it to tap so that uh, it's close enough to actually grab the antigen once it's transported into the rough ER.
Um, and so you can see here that the things that are going to be um, processed include ubiquitinated proteins, um, as well as sort of misfolded proteins that are coming off the ribosome called uh, defective ribosomal products or DRIPS. Um, but uh, either way, you know, we're presenting a lot of antigens all the time. They can come from multiple locations, but the point is that they are cytosolic antigens that are being degraded by, uh, by the, uh, ubiquitin the ubiquitin proteasome system. So um, I, I introduced all of these chaperone molecules, and I think uh, your book gives a nice picture of kind of like how this looks, and you can really see uh, the idea of the PLC holding the MHC class 1 molecule together. Here you can see um, calreticulin, ERP57, and tapacin really just sort of forming a, a little ring that kind of hugs the MHC class 1 molecule and prevents it from falling apart. So um, again, you know, the structural biology here is not super important, but um, uh, this is a nice visual indication of what these molecules are doing. Um, in, in terms of their chaperone function. Okay, so we've introduced all of the chaperones of the PLC that, that help the MHC class 1 molecule come together and stay together. Um, we just uh, mentioned that um, they all bring the MHC class 1 molecule close to TAP, so what happens next? Well, uh, the proteasome is degrading uh, all the things that it's, that it's gathering from, all the ubiquitinated proteins from cytoplasm, and it's breaking them apart into these peptide fragments. The peptide fragments are being transported out of the cytoplasm and into the rough ER lumen by TAP, which is this molecule here. Um, and often these these fragments, um, they're you know often they're ready to go, and um, they end up being loaded onto MHC class one. At which case, uh, the MHC class one is now finally stable; it doesn't need chaperones anymore once it binds to antigen. And so at that point, it buds off of the ER in a little vesicle. That vesicle goes to the the plasma membrane of the cell, and now the MHC class one is ready. It's it's being sticking out towards the outside world, and it and it can recognize any uh, CD8 T cells that are coming by. Um, however, sometimes the peptide fragment, often the peptide fragments that are coming from the proteasome are not quite the right size. Oftentimes they're a little bit too long. Remember that MHC class 1 uh, can only bind to really short peptide fragments. And so there's an additional enzyme um, called ERAP. Um, which is uh, another um, protease, uh, an amino protease, um, which cleaves the, the peptide fragment at its amino terminus um, into even, an even little bit shorter peptides. And so this process is called peptide editing. Um, so this enzyme, uh, ERAP, um, just kind of sort of trims the peptides to make sure they're exactly the right size that they need to be in order to bind to the MHC class 1 molecule. So um, uh, in this case, you can kind of see it cuts off the little tails here in, in the cartoons. And so now the peptides are the right size in order to be actually loaded onto the MHC class 1 molecule. So, okay, so all of these major proteins are important to know. Um, all of the chaperones, which kind of hold the, the, um, the, the immature MHC class 1 molecule together. Um, they bring them in association with TAP, which is the transporter, which moves the peptides out of the cytoplasm and into the ER. And then those peptides are edited by ERAP. Um, where um, they're uh, finally ready to bind to the MHC class 1 molecule, which then traffics to the cell surface. Okay, so that is the process of, uh, of endogenous, of the endogenous antigen pathway. Um, so let's summarize. So as I introduced in the beginning of the lecture, antigens go through distinct processing before presentation. Um, intracellular or endogenous antigens are presented by MHC class 1. Again, these tend to be viral antigens or intracellular bacteria. Um, in contrast, extracellular or exogenous antigens are presented by MHC class 2. So these tend to be um, larger extracellular pathogens like other types of bacteria, parasites, and so on. Um, endogenous antigens require proteolytic uh, degradation into small peptide fragments. So um, the antigens themselves are too big. We need really, really short uh, amino acid sequences in order to load them onto MHC class 1. So this happens uh, via the ubiquitin proteasome system, which cleaves the antigens into those short uh, peptide fragments. Um, and these, these antigenic peptides are transported into the rough endoplasmic reticulum by the enzyme TAP. Um, MHC class 1 requires a significant help from chaperone molecules in order to fully assemble. So the first molecule is calnexin, which stabilizes uh, the MHC class 1 alpha chain until beta 2 microglobulin can bind. Um, and following that, other members of the peptide loading complex, or PLC, um, they hold the MHC class 1 molecule together until the antigen can actually be loaded onto it. 
Um, finally, um, binding of the antigen stabilizes, it finally stabilizes the MHC class 1 molecule. So uh, that's where we need to get to at the end of this process. Um, the enzyme ERAP uh, trims peptides to appropriate length to make sure they fall within that narrow range of sizes that the MHC class 1 can actually bind to. Um, and, but once this process finally happens, the complex of MHC class 1 and antigen traffics to the cell surface where it can be uh, then, uh, where it can then bind to uh, the T cell receptor of a CD8 T cell. Okay, so this was the processing of endogenous antigens. In the next lecture, we're going to talk about the flip side, uh, which is the processing of exogenous antigens uh, through uh, the MHC class 2 pathway. See you then.